special about him. He had this special thumb technique, right? Who is it? Our person that had this same special thumb here? I remember one of you guys had that same thumb. Oh yeah, Kira had one like that. <laughs> That's right. And, and Peter showed you how to play the guitar with that thumb. Anything else? Any special things you remember? because you scare me. <laughs> um, I'm from Indianapolis, and I went to school there and grew up not far from Indiana Avenue. Um, nobody in my family was musical, so there was no incentive to really want to play a musical instrument. We had, and you two, much, much too young as your, as your parents and grandparents would be, to know about player pianos. They used to have a piano that had perforations in, a, in a, a roll that you put on the piano, and you pump your feet, and the piano keys went down and played music by itself, and I drove my parents crazy <laughs> pumping that thing to make it play. Um, when I got to the seventh grade, uh, I was very, very interested in music. I listened a lot to music, even though I didn't play. But I heard music at church, and I heard music basically on the radio. But when I was in the seventh grade at my school, they sent a teacher around to find out if anybody wanted to try to learn how to play music. And uh, unfortunately, they had only so many instruments to go around. And they would ask you, well, what do you want to play? So I got the last instrument that they put up, which was a trombone. How many of you know what a trombone is? <clears throat> okay, so I picked the trombone, which was my first mistake. I'm kidding. Uh, so I started with the trombone, and at that time it cost 50 cents to rent a, would rent a trombone for a year. I rented the trombone, and at the end of one week, my teacher sent the trombone, took the trombone back and sent my 50 cents back to my brother and said I didn't have any talent. So that was kind of discouraging particularly at an early age like that, to, to be told that you can't, you, you're not going to be able to do it because you're not smart enough to play perhaps. At any rate, a little later, I went to a place called Christmas Islands High School, which is off of Indiana Avenue, or very close to Indiana Avenue. Much of the activity in Indianapolis would have been taken, as, as you found out from Larry Clark, and from listening to talk, him talk about West Montgomery, that much of the activity took place was in a very, very circumscribed, a very narrow area. Uh, for instance, Indianapolis was a big city, it was a big city then. But most of the black population probably went to, well actually, three schools. I went to a, a grade school, which was called 56, which was a block from where I lived. And consequently, we could, I could walk to school. But when it came to the seventh grade, we went to a different school. 
when I went to school, which was called School 26. There, we met and learned to play instruments and whatever until we got ready to go to high school. At any rate, I tried the trombone and they took the trombone back. So the next time I had an opportunity to pick an instrument, I found out that they didn't have any instruments for me. So I made myself uh, a tuba. It wasn't a very good looking tuba, it wasn't a very efficient tuba. I made it out of a cigar box and I got some rod, metal, uh, paper, uh, wood rods and I put some springs like you have on a bicycle in a cigar box and I made myself an instrument and I would sing along with the band and with the orchestra when they would play. And I had a wonderful teacher named Russell Brown who said that he thought I must be talented because he saw me back there fingering this invisible instrument, if you will. And um, so he reminded me with a thing called a sousaphone. I'm not sure they even have sousaphones anymore. How many of you even know what a sousaphone is? A sousaphone is a kind of tuba, it's except it curls. And um, I decided, well, I would like to try that. And so I really began to play a little bit. It was not jazz music, but because jazz music wasn't allowed in the schools at that time, high schools, grade schools, or any other schools. This was something that was a very more, very recent kind of addition, if you're thinking, of course, the last 20 years or so. Um, but I had a teacher who believed that I could learn. And so he started me in music, and I had a lesson every week. We went to contests like you will do if you're musicians uh, as you get older. And I sang in the choir, not very well, but I sang in the choir, and spent a lot of time learning to try to play this instrument called the tuba, still knowing that in the back of my heart, I wanted to really be a trombone player. I chose the trombone finally because I got to march behind the drum majorettes. And it was much more fun marching behind the drum majorettes than it was a bunch of guys. <laughs> so I stayed out of trouble as much as possible. I learned to play the, the front learned to play the tuba, which now brings us to what uh, Monica had spoken to you about Indiana Avenue. It turns out that Christmas Island High School is on a place called uh, Northwestern. And um, everything that was happening was there. There was a Walker Theater, and I don't know if you've ever even heard of the Walker Theater, but the Walker Theater was a black, black theater, and it had movies, it had dances, and it was the only place at that time as a Negro that I could go. I mean, so every Sunday we would have dinner down there, and there were bands that played there, and we would try to sneak in. I was, of course, very interested in the music, but I wasn't old enough to get in. So what I did was I bought a tam. A tam is a kind of French hat, it's kind of fancy. And I bought an eyebrow pencil, and I drew a mustache on my face so I would look older. And I got some glasses like this, except they didn't have any glass in them. And I would go, go to try to get in and hope that it didn't rain before I had to erase my mustache. Sometimes I got in, sometimes I didn't get in, but I got a chance to hear a lot of music and the people that you've been listening to about West Montgomery, the Hampton family, uh, a guy named David Young, George Bright, J.J. Johnson had been one of the most famous trombone players of all times who went to that same school. Uh, Leroy Vinegar, another one, gigantic base, both in size and in talent, also went to that school. But the real advantage was that we had almost all of the major teachers who wanted to teach because at that time, black schools, black teachers didn't teach white schools. White teachers didn't teach black schools. So we had, for instance, all of the black teachers in one place. At this time in Indianapolis, there were only about nine high schools, the cathedral, Tech, Arsenal Tech, Sharpridge, which is where Dick Luger, who now as a senator, uh, went to school. Uh, but in those schools, we had a, 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 an awful, an awful lot of talent, and it was what to do with that talent. 
And so consequently, I began to meet, meet a lot of people on Indiana Avenue even before I was, too, it was old enough to get into the schools, I mean into the clubs. And I began to realize that all of this was in a centralized area. For instance, at one end of the block, I mean, one end of Indiana Avenue, was the Walker Theater. The Walker Theater was a, a, a building put together by a lady named Madeline C.J. Walker. And she was the first black millionaire in, this, in, the, in the United States, and certainly the first woman to be a black millionaire. She invented something called hair products. At that time, all young kids, young women wanted to look like Shirley Temple. And so they had these little curls that they would put in their hair, and they would learn how to dance like Shirley Temple did, and they tried to smile like Shirley Temple. How many of you have even heard of Shirley Temple? <laughs> Can I trust you? Have you really heard of Shirley Temple? <laughs> At any rate, Shirley Temple was a very, very pretty little girl, and she danced with a man named uh, Bojangles, uh, who was a tap dancer, and there are all of these movies that keep coming back with them in it. At any rate, uh, Indiana Avenue was a safe haven. There was the YMCA, the YWCA, the Christmas Alex High School, the, the, the grade school that a guy named Oscar Robertson went to. Oscar Robertson was one of the most famous basketball players ever in the world. If, if any of you have even the vaguest notion about basketball, he was somebody who turned Indianapolis into a, a mecca, mecca for basketball players in the sense that the very first team to ever win a championship from Indianapolis was Christmas Alex High School. And it was because of Oscar Robertson. Oscar Robertson, for you guys and girls who play a little basketball at all, averaged a triple-double for two years, and this was unheard of at the time. But at any rate, we were on the map now. And so consequently, the high school was there, because it's 86th the school that Oscar went to, and all of the other places like the uh, uh, places where we would have the school to play ball or to play checkers or the box or whatever we wanted to do. So it was very interesting growing up in Indianapolis when, because this was the time before we uh, could just walk to school. We had to be bused to school. We did. Many of you are being bused to school because I saw you bus out there when I, when I came in. But it was a little different kind of situation at that time because we went to different schools, uh, the black people did, uh, from, the white, from white people. So this was a very, very interesting kind of situation. I grew up under, in that school, listening to People like J.J. Johnson. J.J. Johnson was a trombone player, but he wasn't just a trombone player, he was the trombone player in the sense that he invented things that other people couldn't do on that instrument. But I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I used to go in the, in the halls of uh, Christmas Island High School, and they have all of the graduating classes' pictures on the walls. And uh, I would go look at J.J.'s picture every day and wish that I could play like that not knowing that someday he would be a very close friend and also my teacher as a trombone player. We began to try to play jazz. We were, I had a group, was in a group by my teacher, Mr. Brown, called, what was it? The Rhythm Rockets. The Rhythm Rockets. And we were the worst band that was ever invented. I mean, we played, we, we, none of us played very well. Uh, we were going to play for what, the military ball. My dad worked at the post office and he would come past Christmas Island High School on the trolley car at night, nine o'clock, when he got done. We, we stacked the mail and stuff. And so we played for the military ball with the rhythm rockets. And to show you how bad we were, I danced and when he passed Christmas Island High School, that evening, the dance started at 9 o'clock. At 15 minutes after 9, the gym was empty. We played so badly. So that was kind of a thing to be uh, unhappy about. But we persevered and learned to play. I got to know Wes Montgomery very well, because Wes was 10 years older than I was. And 
he helped me a lot. He taught me about the chords, even though he couldn't name the chords. He could play them on the instrument and show you how to play that instrument. Uh, the Hampton family, whom you've already heard about, was a big family. Everybody in the family played an instrument. And most of them played multiple instruments. When I played in the band, I was probably, oh, 16, maybe 17. And we didn't get paid. The band family got paid. But the ones of us who weren't in the family, at the end of every job, they, we would pass a filling station where they had ice cream and cones and popsicles. And they gave us popsicles instead of money. Uh, you can't live for long on popsicles alone, so don't try it. But it was a fun time. We practiced in the, in the home of the Hamptons family. And when we would take a break, they would have a big tub. You don't even know what tubs are, but it's a big container of water or whatever. And uh, they would put Kool-Aid in there. And so at every break, we would get a, a paper cup, go dip, get a dip of Kool-Aid, <coughs> drink our Kool-Aid, and try to learn to play our piece of music. So it was a wonderful time to be growing up in Indianapolis because then everybody gravitated toward, <coughs> excuse me, toward the Hampton family. The family was fairly large, 10 to 12 people, but that place that, we, that they practiced would have all of us in there. And they taught us how to play. They many times didn't know much more than we did. So we listened to records and we learned how to Im imitate what was on the records. At any rate, it was an exciting time to be growing up in Indianapolis. Indiana, Indiana Avenue now is famous. It was famous then because people were there and there of the major figures in jazz to find new people to play. There were two major hotels there that served black people, and they had jazz groups in there. And so anybody who wanted to play jazz could learn to play jazz simply by being around all of these people who already knew how to play jazz. But we also played other kind of music, too. We played classical music. And uh, there were times that I got in trouble. Um, we played a piece uh, that had a tuba, tuba line in it that went boom, 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 which was uh, a wonderful piece, except I'd heard it on the record played like this, ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da. So when we got ready to play it, that's what I played. And my teacher said to me, David, that's not the way it goes. So we start again. Instead of ba ba, I'm going ba ba la ba la. Mr. Brown said, David, that's the, not the way it goes. And this time I was dating a girl who was the flute player. And I was embarrassed because he kept stopping me. So the next time he stopped me, we started again, and I played it the same way. He said, young man, you're the most foolish young man I've ever known. He said, you run into a wall, and the wall doesn't move, and your solution is to get back further and run faster and hit it harder. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you have been hard-headed enough to have that happen to you, too. But growing up in Indianapolis was so very, very special. And for a long time, it kind of faded into the background because there was so much happening in other urban areas, Detroit, Chicago, uh, New York, LA, and it took a long for the time for the research because there were not a recording studios there at that time. And I'm sure Monica, I think I told you about how West Montgomery was discovered. We all wanted to be discovered. So we played all the time and played for everybody for any amount of money or no money at all. Uh, Wes happened to be in the right place at the right time. I'm the one who took uh, uh, rest of West, uh, the rest of the jazz play players who come into the house to play a concert down to hear West Montgomery. And as you've heard before, a guy named Orrin Keatnews was a very, very close friend. And Orrin Keatnews was the owner of the recording company. He was just made a jazz master three weeks ago in, when we were in, uh, in New York. But anyway, he recorded Wes, and we all hoped that we would someday be recorded and uh, maybe be famous, but at least to be recorded. What, 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 would you, what, what do you want to hear about me? Ask me, and I'll be glad to tell you.
You don't need to be bashful. I was bad. I really was a very, very poor player until much, much later. But practicing made the difference. I had a tuba that I carried with me because it didn't have a case. And so I, when I would get on the trolley car to go home, I would play, sit in the back of the trolley and I would play the tuba. And the people <coughs> who were coming from home from work didn't need to hear a tuba playing at that, that five in the afternoon when they're getting off of work. So finally, the lady who drove the bus told me, you either leave the tube at school or you won't ride this bus anymore. I tried to hide the tube, but the tube was too big to hide. So I, I ended up singing at first to try to make music keep myself. So yeah, we practice all the time. And when I did really start to be a professional, I practiced five, five or six hours a day sometimes in addition to playing. Uh, had I been a basketball player or a football player or into sports, I probably would have been doing that instead. But since I was a musician, I had a teacher who for a quarter would give me a lesson, and if I didn't have the quarter, he would give me the lesson anyway. And so consequently, pretty soon I was able to play and think about maybe having a career in music. Other, yes? <laughs> yes, I ultimately did. Uh, I prayed about it, I begged, I pleaded. Uh, at any rate, yes, I started recording. Uh, actually, right out of school, I started recording. It, it was, they weren't good recordings, because at that time, they had me invented the, anything other than and the tape, you don't even know what the tape is. But these are tapes before they had records. And they would simply put a microphone in front of you and you would play and hope that you got it right. Ultimately, now you're dealing in iPods and iTunes and all of these kind of things. They didn't exist at that particular time. But yes, I got a good, a good start recording. And my first recordings were with West Montgomery and Sly Hampton, with the people we were talking about on Indiana Avenue. Ultimately, I was signed with a major label and recorded for Capitol Records and recorded for Decca Records and all the other famous recording companies. But that comes a long time after a lot of hard work. And if you're not prepared to do hard work, uh, probably music isn't the way you should go. Yes? Yes. How did you get interested in music? 
good question. How did I get interested in music? I guess I was surrounded by music from the time I was born. Um, radio was the thing at that time. And every day at 4 o'clock, this was you know, after school was out, there was something called Easy Gwen. And he played all the popular recordings at the time. And so I got to listen to music. I went to church on Sunday. They played music there. I tried to sing in the choir. My voice was awful. But I sang in the choir. Uh, I was surrounded by music because I would hear it in the movie theaters when I went to the movie theaters. And the very fact that I really thought that this was something that I really wanted to do more than anything else. Uh, I was encouraged with that piano that we had, which was out of tune in the one that you pumped. Uh, I had other people who were my buddies, and I noticed that they played instruments, and they played instruments, and they got to date all the girls. So I learned to play an instrument as a, as a help for that. <laughs> yes? Um, do you still play the tuba today? I'm sorry? Do you still play the tuba today? <laughs> <laughs> no, the tuba's in my background. I'm a cello player now. Uh, and uh, I've been through a number of instruments. I had a car accident uh, coming from Fort Wayne many, many years ago and did damage to my arbiter. That's what we call the lips when you play a brass instrument. And eventually I had to stop playing that instrument simply because it was no longer possible for me to make an arbiter. And so I switched first to bass and then I switched to piano and the more I tried all those instruments, the more I found out I couldn't play them. So finally I ended up playing a cello and my high school teacher took me to pawn shop, and he said, let's put the next instrument will challenge you. And so he bought a $15 uh, cello and put it back together and started me playing cello. So I've been surrounded by music, yeah, all my life. Yes, sir. <laughs> About 2,000 compositions. Some of it's jazz, some of it's classical music. I won an Emmy for the music that I wrote for the, for the 500 for a guy named Charlie Wiggins, a piece called For Golden Glory. But I've written three movies, two about the black frontier, and they were about something called the Buffalo Soldiers. At another time in our history, in the time of General Custer, and when we were fighting the Native Americans, uh, they had like, a, 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 a black group of soldiers who fought called the uh, uh, Buffalo Soldiers. And so I wrote about them, I wrote about the first black musician, a uh, first black soldier at West Point. So yeah, I've written a lot of tunes, probably like I said, close to 2,000 tunes, but that's a, over a lot of years, more years than you can imagine. Yes? Oh. Well, I'll play a portion of it if you want. Was I supposed to bring it? Oh. That's the biggest TV set I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Leg time? Very well done. You know, it, it is so special. I, I teach ragtime. I mean, I teach about ragtime. The fact that, uh, you know, that it was a very popular music at the turn of the century. And we talk about the people who invented it. But I don't have, you know, you have to be a very, very good piano player to play ragtime. And ragtime was born in Kansas City, Indianapolis, urban areas, simply because it had to be where there was a piano. But uh, I like ragtime, and uh, I'm probably be going to be asked this question tomorrow or so in my history class at school, which is about 200 people, and they're listening to the best ragtime players and all the other music. So when you get to IU, keep that question in mind, OK? Yes? Who's your favorite musician? <laughs> I'd have to say it's Quincy Jones. Quincy is a very good friend. Quincy is the one who wrote uh, the music to the Palm Broker, the Color Purple, and so many of those things. And they're probably the best known, one of the best known musicians in the whole world. And we just gave him an honorary doctorate at Indiana University this last, at the end of this last uh, school year. Probably know this thriller album, Michael Jackson. Of course. And I love Michael Jackson, too. I thought he was the most important dance dancer of our time. Yes? Um, um, have you ever been to New Orleans? I'm sorry. Have you ever been to New Orleans? Have you ever been to New Orleans? <laughs> yes, we were just there, what, a month ago. <coughs> and. Uh, Lovely place. I had a little problem with the food because the first day I was there, we went to a restaurant and the guy brought me an alligator sausage and I uh, politely refused. And he said, it tastes just like chicken. So I told him, uh, I'll take my chances. I don't like chicken either. Other questions? Yes? Did you ever try to do anything besides music? Did you ever try to do anything besides music? <laughs> yes, I have a lot of it, a lot of interest besides music is, is the central thing in what I do. But I'm curious. I like to read because I, 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 I want to know about everything. I read about history, I read, I read fiction, and I love basketball. Uh, I don't play basketball, but I'm going to be doing an a interview, and, and uh, I guess you're going to be showing a, a movie by uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, probably the most famous, one of the most famous basketball players of all time. And we're going to be doing something together uh, this end of this month. And so I'm very anxious to meet him, because I don't know him personally. And he was, uh, you know, one, perhaps one of the best basketball players of all. So I'm very interested in sports. I'm interested in books. I love history. I don't like math very well. I'm not very good at it. But yes, I do have other interests. Yes? Have you ever played music in Canada? Yes, I have. I should. <laughs> from the time in Canada. And many of my teaching assistants come from Canada because of, uh, unless you've had a couple of students from there, they spread the word. In fact, there's one of my teaching assistants this year, a young lady, is from Canada. She's a bass player and a wonderful bass, wonderful bass player. Yes? Well, uh, lots of my songs are dedicated to my family, and I take the initials of the family and put those names together. My wife's name is Vida Margaret Bell, so it's Lima Biba, and I make a song with that. But I've written a lot of songs that get played a lot. I wrote one for one of my friends who died, and it was Ted Dunbar, and I wrote something called A Link for Brother Ted. And links are kinds of sausage. And mm -hmm. I talked to him two days before he died, and we were saying then that we would meet that weekend. And uh, 
he always argued whether we had the best barbecue in Indianapolis or did they have it in Texas. And we talked about, well, we'll get some things to see. Unfortunately, he passed away at that next weekend. So I wrote a piece for him called Some Links to Brother Ted. So I've written a, a, lot, a lot of songs that you'll hear, particularly across the, the time that they do the, the, in the Indiana jazz, uh, jazz events, jazz fair, whatever it is in Indianapolis. Yes? I guess I love it all. There's something nice about it, creating something, you know, out of, out of your mind. And so I write a lot, and I enjoy that because that has longevity. Uh, but as a player, I'm interested in that, but probably not to the same extent that I'm writing, simply because in writing, that can last forever. When people, uh, habits change, when new instruments come into being, some of the tunes that I've written won't be played, but I hope that then the things that have been recorded will continue to be played, will be things that people will like, I hope. Oh, sorry.
uh, England. Uh, it's a question of where haven't I been? It looks like we got maybe one more. Young man. Have you met Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I met his, his mentor, who was Quincy Jones. And Quincy Jones was the one who really mentored him and, and was the reason why he was in a, a movie called The Wiz. And I guess, what was that first album that, that was a big hit? Was it Back on the Block or Back on the Block? At any rate, he wrote, he was responsible for helping to produce Thriller. How many of you know what Thriller is? <laughs> I, hit, I, I, I hit the jackpot. Yeah, well, he's the one who helped produce the best-selling uh, CD of, of DVD of whatever it is of all times. Yeah, so uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there for you to at the things that give you passion. Listen to your teachers. They have your best interests at heart. Aside from your parents, they're going to be your best friends. Treat them that way. Well, I would say we thank David very much for taking